for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, how many, how many runners do we have at church today? Raise your hand if you are a runner. You love to run. In fact, this morning you just ran three miles, okay? <laughs> okay? Uh, let me ask you another. Who doesn't like to run? Raise your hand, okay? Yep, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I have two hands up. I, I actually hate running. In fact, I used to just run just because I like to eat. Anybody like to eat, okay? So the only reason I would run is because I like to eat. And then, you know, a couple years ago, I came down with this hip problem. And so I can't run anymore. Therefore, I have to actually have to eat, like, carefully. Who, who in here? You have to actually eat carefully, right? I'll pray for all y'all right now. Just break out in prayer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there was a, speaking of runners, there was this little dude that came to the church for many years. He grew up in our Love Kids area. And for whatever reason, when he would, they would check him in, he would start devising his plan to run away and to like break out the gate and start running. I mean, as a little guy. And literally, like our, our Love Kids team would get their cardio in every, every weekend by chasing this kid down. And there would always be kind of like this phrase, we got a runner, you know? They would just, we got the runner, and, and we would just, you know, the whole team would be chasing him down, and you're like, what are you talking about? Well, um, we got a runner in the text today, and his name is Jonah. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever run from God? <laughs> Have you ever run from his presence? Have you ever run from his call? I know for me, as, as a young kid, as a young boy growing up, I grew up in, uh, in church, and my mom headlocked me to church. I hated it, but I, I, I'd go anyways. But there was an interesting point in my life when I was around 10, 12 years old where I really felt a call of God. And I always had this, this picture that God was out to get me, or if I said yes to him, to the call, that I would have to turn in my cool card and I couldn't have any fun anymore. And so if I'm really honest with you, I ran from the call of God for many years. Last night, they had the Heisman Trophy. Anybody watch that? It was like, that was kind of a picture of me with God, you know, just giving God the stiff arm for many years, not knowing all along that, man, he was a God who wanted to bless me. He had, he had a beautiful plan for my life. He, he wanted to use me to connect with other people that were straying from God, not bad people, that they were just disconnected and they needed forgiveness. They needed, they needed hope. They needed something to change in their life. And, but I was always like, nah, that's, that's, for, that's for geeks and nerds. I, so many years I, I ran from God. And you're gonna see it today in the book of Jonah. Jonah, uh, we call him the prodigal prophet because he was called of God to go to this place called Nineveh, which was the capital city of one of the Israelites' worst enemies at the time, the Assyrians. These people were brutal people. I mean, they would skin people alive. They would chop off heads and make like piles of skulls. I mean, these guys were ruthless, ruthless people. In fact, when they would go and, and into a town and conquer them, they would humiliate the people. They would bring them back to their town. They would mark, they would... <laughs> They would put these hooks through their nose and connect them through a chain, kind of like a, a, what do you call that when you have fish, kind of like all, what do you, like a stringer. They would strip them naked and they would connect them on a, like a human stringer and they would march back to their town. That's how they bring them into captivity. You talk about savages. And so what would happen is now, the, he, Jonah gets this call from God and, and God wants Jonah to go to those people and preach the good news and ask them to repent and turn back to God. And God wanted to forgive them. And Jonah's like, nah, bro, not that dude, not those people. You have that person in your life, they're like, I'll go and, and, and like preach to someone and connect them with God, but not that person. I once had a friend who, his mom was murdered in cold blood and he was so angry. Can you imagine? He comes to Christ, and a couple years into it, this dude's in jail, 
and my friend feels God calling him to go preach the good news of salvation to the guy who killed his mom. I remember him coming to me like, he's like, I know I'm supposed to do this, but it's the last thing in the world that I want to do. This is Jonah. Jonah gets this call and he's like, no. You guys remember it? (laughs) He's like, no, I'm going to go the other way. And what I want to do with this text today is I want to challenge us and encourage us. A, have you been running from just God's presence? You know he got, he's got something else for you and you've been stiff arming him for a long time. It's time to come home to him today. Or you have a specific call in your life for ministry in a certain way, but you've been kind of delaying it. You've been pushing it off. And maybe today, the day, God calls me on assignment to get you out of running from God and into the rhythm of God. It's gonna happen. So let's get into the text. Jonah chapter one, verse one. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amitai. It's like a drink, some type. Jonah, the son of my tie. Get up. It's verse two. Get up. Everybody say, get up. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. It's always interesting for me as a preacher when God calls me to share God's judgment. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with sharing his love, but his judgment's always tough for me. My, in Strength Finders, my number one is belief, and number two is harmony. I just want everybody to get along. The beauty of the combo is I love people so much, I can tell them God's got a plan for your life. The, the penalty of sin is death and destruction. Ah, I don't want you to do that. I want something better for you. So there's this, this interesting combo, and God says, I want you to go pronounce judgment to the Ninevites because I have something better for them. So of course, Jonah, being a very compliant young dude, is gonna go right there, right? Uh, no, first, first point, he runs. Right, write it down in your notes. Someone say run, run. So verse three, but Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction. Sounds like some of your kids, doesn't it right there? In the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa. By the way, when you run from the presence of God, you always know the direction you're going is down. He goes, <laughs> he went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. I mean, that's just comedy to me, isn't it? Like, First of all, let me just give you some context. So God's calling him to go about 500 miles to the northeast to the the capital city of Nineveh. He ends up going literally the opposite way. He buys a ticket to go 2,000 miles west to like the, the end of the known world at the time in Spain. Anybody here like humble enough to admit like you know God's called you to to something different, but you're turning and going the opposite direction. You're like, no, bro, I'm going to go as far away from God as possible. And he runs and he goes the complete opposite way. It said that he bought a ticket. How many how many have bought a ticket and going away from God, it's actually cost you quite a bit. (laughs) it's always interesting to me how sin is exciting, like going away from God. It's exciting in the moment, but it's expensive in the long run. And, and, and he's trying to get our attention going the opposite direction. It gives me a lot of peace that a lot of phenomenal people in the Bible did the same thing. Not just Jonah. Think of Moses. Moses was called by God, a specific call. He goes the opposite way. He's like, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't, I can't do it. Remember Moses? He just, he's like, no, bro, I can't do it. Jeremiah, Jeremiah had a call of God. He's like, I'm just going to stop. These people aren't listening to me. But then it was like fire in his bones and it just erupted. I think of Peter. Peter denied Christ, but Jesus gave him a, a, a second chance. 
I'm grateful. Anybody grateful for the second chances in life? And maybe you're here right now. You, you came in and you're like, I've, I've blown it so bad. There's no way God can forgive me and redirect me onto the path. Can I give you good news? Absolutely can. And you can't run away from his presence. Let me give you a, a scripture to jot down. Psalm 139 verse seven. This is so good. Because we think we can escape God's presence. You can't escape God's mercy. He'll just keep on hunting you down. Listen to this. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, isn't that interesting? Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. It's like when your kids just start running away in the opposite direction and you just like take two steps. <laughs> you can't outrun me. What's really cool as I'm studying this text, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I just wanna give you this because if I don't give you this, uh, I've not done my job. When I'm studying the Bible, many times I make the mistake of having me as the featured guest in the Bible. But w when I was studying Jonah, it really is all about God's character. And, and if, if you don't get anything else from this Bible study, know this, God is merciful. He is a God of mercy. And you see it with Jonah. I'm, I'm like reading it. I'm like, if I asked Jonah to do it and he went the other way, I'd be like, all right, bro, go ahead. I'll, I'll find the next person. I wouldn't waste my time trying to chase him down. But how many of you know God's merciful? And he's also sovereign. God, for whatever reason, chose Jonah out of anybody else. He chose him. God is sovereign. He's, he's above all. He knows all. And he is in control. Even in your worst days, in your worst seasons, in my worst seasons, he's sovereign and he's merciful. So he tries to run. He tries to get away from the presence of God. So God's going to help kind of bring him back in. Listen to verse 4. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods. Who do you shout for when you're in, in, the, in a storm? They're, they're shouting to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. <laughs> oh my goodness, a couple things. Number one, God's merciful and sometimes he'll send a storm to get our attention and that is actually mercy. Sometimes we, 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 we don't understand some of the painful times and pressing seasons of our life is actually the mercy of God to get our attention. These seasons are painful, they're uncomfortable, but under the sovereign mercy of God, it's actually his handiwork to redirect us onto the right path even in the middle of our stubbornness. And he was asleep. I don't know how many times I, in that 10 to 12 years of running from God, I would try to numb myself. That's what I see Jonah doing. He knows he's going the wrong way, but he's like, I'm gonna do whatever I can to not hear the voice of God. I'm gonna go down, down, down. You ever do that? And like, you know God's calling you, but you're like, la, 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 la. Like, you're just numbing yourself so you don't, you don't hear the voice of God. I feel like that's exactly what he was doing right there. He's down, asleep. This is what I find interesting. When we run from God, we don't just make it hard on ourselves, but also innocent bystanders too. He's running from God. It's these guys running the ship. They didn't do anything wrong. But because they're connected with him, they're experiencing this. And so they cast lots to find out who was the culprit. Of course, they figure out <laughs> it's poor Jonah. Look at verse 10 now. Skip to verse 10. The sailors were terrified when they heard this. For he had already told them that he was what? That he was running away from the Lord. And then listen to, this is a fascinating question. Listen to what they asked Jonah. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. Come on, bro, why'd you do it? And I was studying that and I just stopped. First of all, 
Jonah gives the response in chapter four. Let me just give you, I'm going to spoil alert the rest of the story. Jonah gets redirected. He ends up going to Nineveh. He, he shares like a four word message, like turn or burn basically. And the entire city, it's the biggest revival ever recorded, known to man. The entire city repents and there's revival that breaks out. And you'd think that the prophet would be stoked about it. He's actually mad. I'll show it to you, verse, chapter four, verse two. So he complained to the Lord. This is after the revival. He complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That's why I ran away. That's the why. That's why I ran to Tarshish. I knew that you are merciful. Check this out. This is the, this is the God of the Old Testament church. Listen to this. You're a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. You're eager to turn back from destroying people. How about that? He, the reason he didn't want to go is because he knew they'd get saved. That blows my mind. And I was just thinking about this, like, and I will ask you the question that I felt God asking me. Why did you stiff arm God? Why do you run at times from the call of God? And there's several reasons. Uh, let me just give you a couple of them, and then let me dial into a couple that I, th I think are key. Number one, I think we have a warped version of who God is by our upbringing. That's one. Uh, number two, for me, for many years, I liked my sin too much. If I was really just dead honest with you, I knew what God's word said about sex, but it felt really good outside of marriage. I'm gonna do my own thing. This is real. I was fearful of what it would require. How about this? I, I didn't want to give up control and I wanted to be comfortable. Anybody else? But let me zone in on the one that I think could be key to helping us stop running away from God and running to God. And this is crucial. How many, let me ask you a question. How many actually grew up in church? Just raise your hand real quick. Let me get a picture, okay? When, when you grew up, I, here's what I think. I think a lot of us get our picture of God by our earthly father. And this is, again, not to condemn earthly fathers. We're all in process. But, but let me ask you a question. How do you, how did, when you were growing up in church, how did you picture God? Did you Maybe, let me, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do some acting real quick. Y'all ready? Okay, so did you picture God like? If you can't see my face, my eyes twitching. I'm just looking to get, I'm looking to see where you went off so I can smoke you. And some of us were raised in homes and in churches where that's what you sense. The minute you did something wrong, you are gonna get smoked and he's out to get you. And so here, why would I wanna run towards God if that's the kind of God that, that is wanting me to follow him? I'm gonna turn and go the other way. But let me give you another one. How many were raised, and maybe this, maybe this was your version of God. Isn't that a different environment? It's like, oh, dude, I know you can do it. Oh, you're, you're off a bit. Let me, come on, man. There's something better. I got you, bro. I got you. And, and you see like a warm embrace. You see a smile. You see encouragement. You see arms wide open to give a hug. To me, that is a completely different God right there who I want to run from or run towards. And I'm wondering where you're at. I'm wondering if you were, Fed the lie that I had for so many years, he's out to get you. He's not out to get you, he's out to give you something, a completely different life. And then specifically, I'll just be honest with you as well. I'm just, can I be honest? I, I wanna, I won't, that's kind of the way I like to do things. Well, in this season of my life, after how many years, we feel called to plant another location in North Omaha. And on one end, I'm so stinking stoked, man, because like my heart, uh, I grew up in locker rooms. There's a connection with some people in North Omaha that I know I'm called because most often when I'm leaving, I'm crying. How many know when you're crying, you're called? 
You, you have a passion and a care in your heart that's from God. You have the heart of the Father. You know you're called. But can I tell you, it's not gonna be easy. And so there's this interesting, like, God's like, go to the Ninevites, go to North Omaha. Not that the North, North Omaha are Ninevites. I'm not saying that. They're not savages. Like, hey, man, we all got our issues, right? But there's this call, and, and it's weird because on one end, I'm like, I want to obey God. On the other hand, I'm like, that's not going to be comfortable. And God gave me a picture of this. We, we always go to the mountains every um, Thanksgiving, and we walk the mountain. And <laughs> most often when we walk the mountain, it's a, pr- I mean, it's a pretty big hike. And we go, there's like a fork in the road up the mountain. We go left, and it's it's still pretty challenging. You get to the top eventually, but it's still a nice, you're breathing, but not too crazy. And, and for the three first days, we went to the left. And then the fourth day, we get to the fork in the road and to the right, you just gotta know, it's like straight up the mountain. And you talk about glutes on fire, you're like breathing heavy. And my wife looks at me, she's like, hey, I think we should go the right way this time. I was like, uh, I don't think I heard that at all. I'm on vacation right now. <laughs> and uh, I followed the Holy Spirit. I mean, my wife, right? And we, and dude, I'm telling you, like you're walking and just, I mean, your legs are fried by the time. But when you get up there, you're like, oh, I'm so glad I went up that way. We got up there quicker, a lot quicker than I wanted to, but it was beautiful. And I felt God was saying, hey, hey, that's where you're at. You're at a fork in the road there, Pastor. What do you want to do? You want to just keep on going this way? It's going to still be challenging. Or do you want to go straight up and get real uncomfortable right now? And I think that there's some times in life where God's calling us, just like Jonah, to get super uncomfortable. We're like, I don't know about that. (laughs) That's what's happening. This storm's chaotic. And he feels bad for the poor sailors because they're getting thrown under the bus because of his disobedience. So verse 12, he says this, throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it'll become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. I, I kind of like his humility there. Like, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty gnarly. Just throw me overboard. I know I'm going to die, but you guys will live. Just, just chuck me. But the dudes are so noble. They're like, uh, I don't want to do that. Let's just row as hard as we can to get back to the land so now we can drop you off so we're not in this storm anymore. You'll survive, we'll survive, it'll all be good. But they rode harder and harder, but God kind of rode harder and harder with the storm so they couldn't do it. And I, was, I just wanna say this, sometimes we're noble like these guys trying to get someone in your life to the land. Maybe it's actually God's plan that they're making them super comfortable, huh, parents? Not bailing your kids out. Maybe they need to get in the storm a little bit. (laughs) So after rowing hard, they're like, we got to do something about verse 15. The sailors picked Jonah up. (laughs) This is so classic. Just imagine this. They picked Jonah up. They threw him into the raging sea. Look at this. And the storm stopped at once. I was reading this and I I just, I got to share this with someone. I really sense the spirit speak to someone. Be careful who you let board your boat. You're wondering why your life is chaotic right now. Could it be you got a Jonah in the boat? Specifically, someone's, someone here, and I hope you take this in grace, but God's saying, throw the boyfriend out of the boat into the sea and watch your life just remain calm all of a sudden. You're like, ah, I don't know what's going to happen here. Hey, maybe it's just a step of faith and do it in a tactful way. Don't be like, I went to church and I'm a legalistic Christian and I'm sweet. So get out of the boat there, buddy. I'm not saying that, but isn't there something about that? How about you're leading a staff, you're leading a business, a team. And you got the person, you love them so much and you want to keep them on the team, but they come to your meetings late. And when they show up, what do you got to say to me? I would lead it better than you. Maybe you need to boot them off the boat. Maybe that's the most loving thing you can do because they're going to be like, oh my goodness. And all of a sudden your business is calm. All of a sudden the organization has peace again and chemistry again. So they chuck him overboard. Of course, his life's done, right? Nope. 
Why? Because of God's sovereign mercy. Verse 17, number two, rescue. Watch this. Now the Lord had arranged, that hit me, for a great fish. The, the word in the Hebrew is a dag. dag. Dag gum, great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. A couple things right here real quick. This is super interesting. Do you see the sovereignty of God right there? The Lord arranged the rescue at the right time. How many grateful for the check that came in the mail where you thought you were going down and right at the right time, God released resource and, and bailed you out of a position that was actually your fault. Anybody here willing to admit? I remember getting, <laughs> I remember getting someone dropped an envelope with $1,800 of cash way back before we started the church. They spelled my name wrong and put it on the front door, like right by the front door of my house in Fort Lauderdale right at the right time. How many received a call? You were thinking about committing suicide and someone put on, God put it on someone's shoulder to call you and pray for you at just the right time when you were sinking down and God sent something to rescue you right at the right time, his sovereignty. Now, let me take a moment real quick and say this. Some of you are going, a great fish, seriously, pastor, that's just a story in the Bible. That really swallowed him and he was still cool for three days. And I get it. It's a pretty big whale tale. I get, okay, I get it. I understand that. But let me just tell you a couple of reasons why I believe this is to be true. Number one is I believe Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1.1 says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If I can believe by faith, Genesis 1-1, I have no problem believing the rest of the miracles in the Bible. If he wants to create a whale and supernaturally make sure that this person is okay for three days, I have no problem believing it. Number two, Jesus affirmed it. Do you know, you just jot it down if you're a note taker. Um, Jesus in Matthew 12 verse 40 says this, for as Jonah, this is Jesus talking, as Jonah was in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So I'm just going to take Jesus at his word. He said that Jonah did it. I'm going to believe it. Last thing I would tell you is this is actually miraculously happened in real life. I don't know if you knew this, but in 1891, there was a guy named James Bartley who was not a believer and he was working on a whale ship, and they were going to hunt down whales. And as they were in this area, the one whale tail hit the boat, and him and another dude like fell overboard. One of the dudes drowned and died. The, they thought James had drowned and died too, except for the fact that a couple days later, they caught a whale, and as they were slicing the whale up, they found James huddled up in the fetal position in a coma, and two weeks later, they, he revived as he was in the captain's quarters. And this is a true documented story. So even, even that would be my third reason why I believe this story. Like James, Jonah is in the belly of the great fish, three days, three nights. And number three, if you're a note taker, he cries out to God finally after three days, which I don't know why it took him so long, and eventually regurgitates the whale regurgitates him. You didn't know I could work regurgitate into a point in the message, did you, Burke? I got it in there. Chapter two, verse one, then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God from inside the fish. And chapter two, I don't have time to, to break it down, but it's interesting because his prayer is super honest with God. And I feel like that's a place where we need to get. I've been running from God, I've been running from his presence. I've been running from his call. And now I'm in this predicament, this place, and God's, in his mercy, in his sovereignty, has gotten my attention. And from the depths of the well, after three days, because a lot of us are stubborn, he finally cries out. And I want you to see verse 10. The Lord, then the Lord, after the prayer of repentance, of humility, of, of coming back to God, running back to God, 
Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. Were you reading that and just going, I wonder how that happened? Like, was it like projectile vomit? Like, you know, when your kids are really sick, and just, Whoa! you know, I was like, ah! I, rem I remember being in Hawaii one time. I was on the North Shore, and there was this dude. I had just gotten there. I didn't know how to surf, boogie board, nothing. And this dude had a boogie board, this local. I'm like, and, hey, bro, can I roll? And if you go on the North Shore, I mean, these, these waves are huge. In fact, when we were coming in, there was like a gurney with a white sheet. And it was like, only surf if you're a pro. And I'm like, whatever, I'm only gonna be in Hawaii how many times in my life? I'm going. So I grabbed the boogie board and I'm like, yeah, cool. And I, I caught that first wave, it was rolling in. Oh, this is sick, dude. The second one I missed. It was like, oh, I was like, oh, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm, I'm dead, I'm dead. It's like in a washing machine. I'm like on the beach, just like, like looking up going, oh, thank you, God, you gave me another chance. And I feel like that's exactly what happened to Jonah right here. He's like, oh, I'm alive. And because he was like inside the belly of a, of a great fish, the, the juices in the stomach probably has bleached him. And now he's got seaweed everywhere. And you just picture him like, <laughs> just walk, just walk it out. And then chapter three, verse one, look at this. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. I love second chances. He gets a call from God. He runs away, thrown overboard. The fish grabs him and has to expedite because the homie was off. So it expedites the position to bring him back. <laughs> Hurls him. He's there. Gives him the second chance. And what does God say? Verse two. Hey, bro, here's your second chance. Get up. Go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I already gave to you. This time Jonah obeyed. He obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. Most scholars submit 600,000 plus people in the city. In verse four, on the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds. I told you, man, this dude has no tact. 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. I'd be like, bro, that, that message ain't gonna work. You didn't have an opening illustration. You didn't gather your people. You didn't have three points. You didn't have connectors. You have a dope closing story. Dude, that is not gonna work. But how many of you know, if you just obey God and do what he says to do, he does the work. Y'all, we just have to be obedient. He brings the word, no tact, no grace. He just, just walk, you can picture him just walking around. Just, 40 days, y'all, you're toast. This is, that's all he says. But so wild, if you read the text, the king, of, the king right there of Assyria, he's the first one to rip his clothes. And he's like, man, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna repent right now. I'm so sorry, God. He calls a fast, a corporate fast. The people, the animals, he called the animals to fast. This dude was serious. And he even says, he says this in the text. I don't know if you noticed it. He said, perhaps God will forgive us. We, as New Testament believers, we know for sure we will be forgiven. He didn't even know. Perhaps he will. And the greatest revival of all time happens because of God's sovereign mercy. Number four, revival breaks out. Chapter three, verse 10, and here's where we'll land the plane. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways. How many know repentance is a stop and turning the other way? He changed his mind, God did, and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. I'll close with this story. And some of you have heard this, but there was a point in my life where God was giving me a second chance to receive my call. And it was in 1997, and maybe I could speak to you, your first time guest. I'll just, me and you will talk for a second because a lot of these people have heard this, but I want to speak to you. This is just real story. 1997, get cut by the New York Jets, pulled a hamstring. My whole life revolved around athletics. My identity was in athletics. Now I get cut by Bill Parcells. I go back to Iowa State to finish my degree. Didn't know who I was. I was waking, baking, 
sleeping with whoever, doing some dumb stuff, stuff that I never thought in a million years I would do. And I was out one night delivering a bag of weed in a, in a sandwich. I worked at a sandwich store. I went from the NFL to the sandwich store. I was delivering sandwiches freaky fast for the glory of God. Wasn't that the glory of God at that point? <laughs> but check this out. This is a true story. In a snowstorm, I was out one night on my way and God got my attention. He said, I've been calling you for a long time and you've been Heisman me. Do you wanna change today? And a lot of the unplanned pregnancy, the early death, the chaos in your life that you're walking into right now, it will be prevented and you can be blessed and I'll change your life. Do you want it? That was the point that changed my life. By God's grace, I said yes. And now on mission to continue to see people just like wrecked, messed up Pastor Todd back then receive life and a second chance. Do you want a second chance? You want a second chance, man. Stop running, man. Stop running. There's no need to run. Why are we running? God's, he's not out to bash you to get something from you. He's out to give you something completely different. Amen. God, thank you for this word. Love, Jonah. Such a solid picture of your sovereign mercy. And I pray we'd all be reminded here at church, all of our friends online, of number one, your grace and mercy in our life. Not only to save us and just like this king and all his people just stopped the chaos that would have ensued. But even, even when we get uncomfortable, when you give us a specific call and we're, we're overwhelmed by the what ifs or how's it gonna happen or the fear or I can't calculate it financially, you've called us. And so we just wanna pray and obey. Would you help us with that? In Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I want to 